friends, again, it's my pleasure to sit down and be with you today. And I hope that you will be helped by what I may say this day. You know, I, I look upon broadcasting, whether it's TV or radio, like this. If I invited guests into my home for a lunch, I would expect to put something on the table that would be not only good and nourishing for them, but something that'd be delicious and something they would enjoy. That's my whole entire attitude about history. When I go before the cameras or before the microphone and the radio station, or if I'm standing up in the podium to speak somewhere, I never fail to remember that this is like inviting guests for lunch. You've got to put something before them that will be pleasing to the eye, perhaps, and pleasing to the taste and helpful to his nourishment to the body. Well, in this case, history hopefully will be pleasing to hear and something instructive that you can store away in your mind. In my writings, I do this, operate on the same law. Make it attractive, make it useful, make it good. And therefore you will have your readers, in this case we'll have our viewers and our listeners. The last program I emphasized over and over the fact that if a thing can happen, it has happened in Bristol. I think I can say that about all my programs. I, I try to do that, living under that premise that if it's happening, it can happen in Bristol. I'm in the process of writing a new book now and I will be using the same rule in writing the book. Well, let's drop back to 1907. Bristol in 1907. A lot of changes have come about since then. I don't presume to go into the list of those changes. I think you know them as well as I do. There were a few cars, probably not over eight or ten in the town at that time. Most a conveyance was by wagon or horseback, carriage, whatever you might have. Trains were running here then, of course, and had been for many, many years. Uh, almost, I built by that time, 50 years, I guess. And it's hard for most people to believe, but at that time, we had 22 passenger trains a day here. And of course, now we have none. But there came on a passenger train a young black man from way down in Chattanooga. He got a job at 425 State Street. That's on the Virginia side where the old home furniture used to be. That's long gone. The site now would be in a parking lot. A public park, well it's not public, I guess it belongs to the bank, I'm not sure, but anyway it's a parking lot there now. He took a job what was considered by most people a lowly job at the time as shoeshine boy in a Doug Holmes barber shop. And I will add here, this is historical fact and well known, that from early Bristol up to that time and far beyond, nearly all barbers were black men. It's just understood. That I don't think there was one white barber in Bristol for the first 20 or 30 years of its existence. And at this time, 1907, there virtually all the barber shops were operated by black persons. Well, this rather handsome young man, in fact, he was part Cherokee, but not, not a great deal. He uh, shows it in his pictures that I've seen, but uh, anyway, he was a handsome young man. And he took the job as shining mostly the white men's shoes in that barbershop. He made a little that way. I think the going charge then was 15 cents. But uh, once in a while, somebody would be generous, maybe and give him a quarter. But he made most money as operating as the porter for the bathrooms. Now, when I say bathrooms, I don't mean just a restroom. Barber shops in those days, very often, and some even into my time, offered baths. A person could go in and at that time pay a quarter. They'd give you a towel and a little bit of soap, and you went in the back and took a bath. 
aisle for the street. And believe you me, there was many people who needed those baths in that day because there were very few baths in the home. And it was generally understood that most people didn't take baths. Uh, I have in the, well, I'm looking at the old desk now, uh, you can't see it, but I can, that has in one of its doors a water bill for that period. And they went to great trouble to mention on the back of it, the instructions, that the charge will be the same during the winter months whether you take a bath or not. So uh, they warned you ahead of time that you'd be charged the same fee whether you use enough water for a bath or not. Well, anyway, I'm sure he had very needy customers at times for this service. But anyway, he served as the helper in the bath and made some money that way for a purpose. Well, let's back up a little. Let's go way down south to Curryville, Georgia. You never heard of Curryville. It's not on the map today. I can't find it on the map. But I know it was just a broad spot in the road somewhere that they gave the dignified name of Ville, Curryville, Georgia. Curryville, Georgia. You never heard of Curryville. It's not on the map today. I can't find it on the map. But I know it was just a broad spot in the road somewhere that they gave the dignified name of Ville, Curryville, Georgia. It, I know it was near Calhoun in Gordon County, Georgia. That's between Chattanooga and Atlanta. Uh, he was born there in, on June the 3rd, 1887. His mother, after being freed as a slave, had managed to buy up a little land from the people that owned her. And she was operating a small farm along with her husband, William. Uh, then the family name uh, was Hayes. And she, with her husband, she was operating this little farm. Of course, they were very poor folks. And this son was born to them, and he named him Roland Hayes. There might be a few people out there that will immediately recognize the name. When he was uh, just a little boy, now, they moved to Chattanooga, Tennessee, where they thought they could better themselves, and, and probably did. He was 10 years old. When 13, he went to work in an iron foundry. And that's a man's job, uh, to say the least. Worked hard, and by the time he was 16, he was making $3 three dollars a day which is a real good salary for that day and time is a good wage most people were doing it for far far less but he is getting three dollars in a day when most people were lucky to get one as some thought he would make a career of it and just stay there and work in the oil mill but he liked to sing and one time he was singing with a group as a tenor he had a tenor voice and a man named Arthur Calhoun was the concert pianist for this singing group. And he heard him sing. And he went to him immediately after things were over and he said, you must get into the career of singing. You've got a very unusual voice and it can be developed. Well, Arthur Calhoun was doing concerts then across the country. And so he took this young Roland Hayes and brought him to Bristol to a concert. Well, like myself, Roland Hayes was impressed with this town here, this city here, and so he left his job against uh, others advising not to. He left his job in Chattanooga and came to Bristol. Well, he got the job, as I've described before, in the barbershop. And <coughs> I'm sorry, we're going to have to cut in here. <laughs> I've got a t thing in my voice. <coughs> It'll it'll improve. You can, you can cut it, of course, when it go through it. I learned. I thought used to had ruined it when I did that, but uh, I learned from the first deal I had that they could always make a correction. <clears throat> I have that trouble once in a while, but um, I th I think maybe now. I mean, I've got the probably I had a cookie while ago, and it's probably a crumb in my th <laughs> <laughs> That happens so far. I'll try it right on now. Anyway. Uh, even though he was employed in the barbershop here, he was still singing around to 
sponsored groups. And when, as soon as he saved a, a few dollars, the fall of, of 1907, he left here and went and applied. Uh, some people thought it was brave of him to even do that. But he applied to Fisk University in Nashville, Tennessee. Jenny Robertson was the director of music at that time. She took him right in and enrolled him in the college and she got a job for him in a white man's home in order to be able to pay his expenses. He graduated with honors in 1910. From there he went to Boston, Massachusetts and studied with the Harvard Extension classes, music of course, uh, that were being held in the Boston YMCA. And f graduated there and continued to take training and wherever he could. After eight and a half years training, he went on the road as a concert singer. He took two men helpers. One was William Lawrence, who would play the piano, and the other whose name slips me right now, but he was the baritone singer. And they toured America, became rather well known. Uh, Mr. Roland Hayes became well known as a tenor vocalist. Well, he even shot for higher heights against the advice of the man with whom he's working at the time. He had gotten a permanent position, would have been permanent, with the Boston Symphony o Orchestra. And the man there who was in charge said, I advise you to stay here. You're wanting to go to Europe, but I think you've gone as far as you can go, and I don't believe this is advisable. Against that man's advice, he sailed for Europe. And within one year, he was invited to sing before the King and Queen of England. He was making good in Europe, and the very same man that advised him not to go realized what he had on hands, and he made a trip to Europe to bring him back to America so he could become even more famous here. And in the years to come, he traveled all over America uh, singing and uh, being, becoming well-known, better known all the time. He had his old place back with the Boston Symphony Orchestra. And at that time, he was making over $100,000 a year. And that uh, was fabulous in those days. If you had a $100,000 income, you could live in a fine mansion, live like a king, hire servants and everything else. It usually goes with super wealthy people. But he remained humble. He still knew his beginnings, and he remained humble as he became more and more famous as the years passed. 1933, he married a Miss Mann. Her name was Mann. He didn't marry a man. He married a lady whose name was Mann. And they had one daughter born. Her name was Africa, A-F-R-I-K-A, -I, I guess based on their nationality. But uh, I don't know, have no further information on her. I don't know what happened to her. But he continued in his career, and he loved to travel back and forth. In 1952, he returned here to Bristol for a big concert. It was held in the auditorium of the Bristol Virginia High School on a Thursday night, and people crowded that room. Well, no, they all couldn't get in. Uh, they had to turn many of them away. They just couldn't crowd into the room. There's, it's been told me by old Thomas, many living yet who remembered it, that uh, there was many people outside wanting to get in as there was inside. So uh, you see how he was thought of. At that time, now remember this was in the days of severe segregation. At that time, there were two fine big hotels here, the General Shelby and the Bristol Hotel. But he could not be taken into either one of them. Uh, Bristol Hotel had some quarters in the basement, but it wasn't fitting a person this famous. So he had met a young barber when he was here by the name of Stan Hope Stacy, Lacey. And he was taken into the Stan Hope Lacey home at 501 Clinton Avenue and was their guest. Bob Loving, with the Bristol newspaper at the time, went there and made his picture sitting on the couch by Mrs. Lacey. And he described him as having a super personality that just bore into your mind you couldn't forget him. Well, I can understand that. That does happen to some people. He wrote an article, and somebody clipped that article from a paper. 
and somewhere I know not where, I do not how, but somehow that clipping came into my hands. And I would have never known about this had, had someone not saved that clipping. Save your clippings, folks. You can't imagine what might come from them sometime. Well, in this modern age, I, get, I have a researcher on my staff now, and in this, uh, he's a volunteer like my secretary, but uh, I called him and before I barely got the name out of my mouth, he had him pulled up on the internet and he gave me loads of information about him. I think it would be unfair to him to not, when I finish this and I'm ready to finish this program. He died on January the 1st, 1977 at the age of 89. Now then comes something that you need to know. Pretty soon, the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga built a center, a music center, and named it in honor of the boy that was leaning over the seat in old Holmes Barbershop doing the lowly task of shining shoes. The man now has a music center name for him. You can go far if you're determined that's my last advice to you today. If you're determined enough and willing enough to make the sacrifice, you can obtain any goal that you seek. Till we meet again, may the best in your life be yours.